From Broadsheet, Australia's go-to culture guide, this is FYI, a podcast about the stories we reckon deserve a closer look. I'm Katja Vaktel. Let's talk about salt. For decades, it's been cast as a villain. We've been told we're eating too much of it and it's bad for our health. But today, in our home kitchens, we're cooking more like professional chefs than ever before. And chefs love salt. So how can we learn to use it better? And does the perfect amount of seasoning actually exist? Why do some of us feel so strongly about adding it to our food and others avoid it at all costs? Broadsheet Sydney editor Shay Marie Treek went on a mission to find out. Hi, Shay. Hey, Katja. Shay, I feel like we've really changed the way we use salt at home in our cooking in recent years. Yeah, 100%. I think that even though those health risks you mentioned haven't really gone away, a lot of us are learning to cook more like chefs at home. We're picking up skills from YouTube and pro chefs cookbooks. Yeah, totally. And chefs like Sam and Nostrat, who wrote the book Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, have taught a lot of people that salt does heaps beyond just adding saltiness. Yeah, salt, fat, acid, heat was huge when it came out a few years ago. I remember that. It really was. It was a bestseller. It changed the way I cook. It won a bunch of awards and it was made into a Netflix series. And Nostra has really helped to demystify and explain why salt is such a magical ingredient. Oh, magical? I feel like that's a very big claim, Shay. Well, if you know how to use it right, it seriously intensifies the flavour, not just of savoury food, but sweet food as well. It can affect texture. It can be used to preserve food for years. And there's loads of different types out there with highly specific flavours. But somehow we all taste and tolerate salt differently. It is magical. Chefs are obsessed with it, and for good reason. Okay, but how does a chef know if they've salted too much or not enough? Like you mean, is there a perfect seasoning? Yeah, exactly. I've had experiences at restaurants where I think a dish is so salty that it's inedible, but everyone around me is raving. This was something I wanted to find out. Is there really such a thing as the perfect seasoning or the perfect amount of salt? It seems so subjective. And why do some people rarely add any salt to their food, but someone like my dad absolutely piles it on? That's so not me. That's so funny. My dad loves salt. His enthusiasm for the salt shaker meant that when I was growing up, you'd usually leave our kitchen with grains of salt pressed into the soles of your feet. He bought cholesterol-lowering margarine and avoided sweets, but whether he was eating steak, bacon, broccoli or spag bowl, he'd go absolutely ham on the white stuff usually without even tasting the dish first. I never quite got the appeal. It even took me a couple of years after I moved out of home to buy a salt shaker. Years of salt is bad health messaging just kind of made me feel, what's the point? Since then, I've shaken that aversion. But there are still plenty of people out there who can't get behind salt. I started asking around our office to see if anyone had really strong opinions about it. Our executive producer, Ellen, loves a bit of salt but it turns out her mum, Cheryl, definitely does not. So I got Ellen to give her a call. Hello, Ellen. Hello, Mum. I'm calling to talk about salt. Okay. Yes, I'm ready. So we're doing an episode of the show about salt tolerance, and I told everybody at work how much you deprived us of it when we were young. So... <laughs> We thought, <laughs> thought we'd get you to explain your salt stance. Right. Okay. Happy to be of service. <laughs> okay. So first question, what's your approach to salting your food? To use as little as possible. <laughs> In the 80s, there was increased messaging about the importance of a healthy diet and, you know, your responsibility to your family and it wasn't just salt, a focus on how much sugar, fat, preservatives and salt were in our diets. So many of us became much more careful about how much salt we put in our diet. So what if I told you I salt my oatmeal? No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what? Um, it just makes everything, it gives everything like a bit more depth. I've probably trained myself out of eating too much salt. You become accustomed to a lot of salt. There are some things I put salt on. Oh, yeah? Like what? 
I'd put it on steak, but I only have steak like every couple of weeks, if that. And I think eggs, you have to have salt on eggs, but that's about it. Ever wanted to know what chefs cook at home? Homemade is Broadsheet's new cookbook with over 80 at home recipes by top Melbourne chefs, including Andrew McConnell, Julia Busatil Nishimura, Dan Hunter, and more. Get yours at shop.broadsheet.com.au. My dad loves salt. Ellen's mum is the opposite. Everyone has different approaches to salting their food. Maybe, like Ellen's mum, they're thinking about their health. Maybe their family just never had salt in the house. Or maybe they simply come from a culture that isn't that big on salt. I asked around. My friend Kate adds salt to dishes when her boyfriend's not looking, but others weren't too bothered either way. For such a simple mineral, it's pretty divisive. Even in the broadsheet office, people had a lot of feelings. My grandpa is such a salt fiend that he once made custard with salt instead of sugar and it took him at least a couple minutes to actually realise. At uni, a friend once made me feel really bad for putting salt on lettuce. And I still think about that today. Like, why wouldn't you want to season your salad? I love salt and pretty much salt everything. The strange thing is my mum absolutely hates salt. And growing up on her cooking, she never used it. And I just think that's so weird. I love margaritas, but I order them as Tommy's for the pure reason that I don't like salt on the rim. I love it just straight up on ice, no salt. But I do know that people love it and they know that it adds to the drink, but it's just not my thing. Yeah, when I asked around about it, everyone had an instant opinion. No one had to think about it. It makes sense. Salt has been part of our diets for thousands of years. In early China, we're talking 6,000 BC, wars were fought over Yangtze salt reserves. Salt cakes were used as currency in parts of Central Africa, and Roman soldiers were paid in salt, hence the word salary. The human body can't function without the stuff. It helps our cells to maintain pressure and function properly. Pre-industrialization, we got it from game meat. But as we started changing up our diets, we had to start adding it ourselves. And if you've ever craved more salt in a dish or couldn't stop at one handful of salty, salty potato chips, you're not alone. There's a thing called a mineral lick, which is literally a salt and mineral deposit where animals go, in the wild or on a farm, to lick up that salty flavour. And Japanese macaques, those cute pink-faced monkeys, have been recorded dipping potatoes in salt water when fresh water was just as accessible. Us humans also like salt, but unlike animals, we can choose how much we want to use from a shaker. So why do some of us seem to like it more than others? In the 1980s, an American researcher coined the term super taster. Super tasters are thought to have a gene the rest of us don't, as well as a higher concentration of taste buds, which, as the term suggests, means they have an elevated sense of taste. They perceive bitter, salty, sweet and spicy flavours in technicolour. The theory goes that one in four of us are super tasters, and these people not only taste that delicious saltiness to the max, but they need to balance out the extreme bitterness they experience by adding, you guessed it, salt. It's all a lot to wrap our heads around. So we asked Danielle Alvarez, a top Sydney chef, one who's trained in big name American restaurants like Chez Panisse, to give us her professional take on salt. I love salty things. I'm quite addicted to it. And I think that's where my love of food actually started was like, you know, my grandmother used to make this a little snack in Spanish called chicharrones, which are like crispy fried pork skins. And she would put lots of fine salt on them. You know, they were salty, delicious, addictive. And that's one of my earliest memories of salty, crunchy things. (laughs) Danielle is the head chef of Fred's Restaurant in Paddington, Sydney. They do rustic farm-to-table fare, house-made ravioli stuffed with roasted asparagus, lamb leg cooked over an open fire, grilled artichoke pulled straight from the ground, that sort of thing. She recently released a cookbook called Always Add Lemon. Danielle says that, like lemon, salt enhances flavour. Some people love salt, others hate it. But behind the scenes, it's really critical in cooking. I think the biggest mistake that a lot of home cooks make is not adding enough salt to something 
or not adding it at the right time. I think there's a little bit of a misconception around when to add salt to a dish. You never want to wait till the end to add all the seasoning. You want to make sure that you're adding in salt at every step of the way. So every time you add an ingredient, you add a little pinch of salt and so on. It's interesting when you add salt in this way, little by little at every step of the process, you end up using less salt than if you tasted something at the end and thought, oh, now I need to add the seasoning. It's remarkable how much less salt you'll use if you just add a little bit each time. If you're wondering what this means for us home cooks, Danielle translated it into terms we can relate to. When talking about adding things little by little, we'll use a bolognese. I think that's something we all make at home and can understand. If you add a bit of salt in with your mirepoix ingredients, so your celery, your carrots, your onion, your garlic, and you take the time to really cook down and concentrate those vegetables, what the salt is doing is not just seasoning, but it's also pulling out the water that is inside those vegetables That water then can cook out and evaporate. Those veggies get nice and soft and they start to actually caramelize. So develop a little bit of sweetness. So here now we've taken something that really could be a step that you rush through. But if you take the time to season it at that moment and really let it cook down, you're starting to add in sweetness into the dish, which is interesting. Adding salt can contribute to adding sweetness into something, but it's true. And then from there on, if you season the mince before you add it into the mirepoix, the same thing, then you add in the tomatoes and you season that. And when all of those things start to come together and after you've simmered them for several hours, they marry in a way that adding salt at the end, you'll just never achieve the same level of flavor as if you add salt at each one of those steps. But salt isn't just for savory food, right? I think it's interesting to note that salt still really has a place in desserts. I'm not sure that most people would agree with me on that, but I think a little pinch of salt in most things, like whenever I make an ice cream, I always add a pinch of salt because sometimes like sweetness can become just too cloyingly sweet, but a little pinch of salt will bring out the flavors of whatever you have mixed in with the sugar. So it brings out that flavor of vanilla. It brings out the flavor of lemon in in a custard or whatever dessert you're making. And it really does help to balance bitterness. And even if I'm drinking a particularly bitter coffee, the tiniest little pinch of salt will just take that bitterness away. It's really interesting. Broadsheet's cookbook range includes more than 300 recipes from the country's top restaurants and cafes. So you can recreate the best of the best at home. And they're just $49.95 each. Find all four online now at shop.broadsheet.com.au. Well, back in the day, Aussies were pretty happy just throwing a pinch of the good stuff over their meat and three veg when their meal was ready, a la my dad. It seems we're finally getting the hang of how to use it right. Look, salt is crucial. There's an Italian saying that pasta water should be as salty as the Mediterranean Sea, and I've taken this to heart. Full credit to my dad, who sprinkles a bit of salt on his watermelon. It adds a little bit more texture and sweetness that makes it so much more juicy in the summertime. And if anyone knows a few things about the powers of salt, it's Alexandra Olsen. Her family company, Olsen's, has been harvesting and selling Australian salt for decades. That's right. I'm talking to big salts. Different salts produced in different areas should and do taste differently if they're allowed to showcase themselves naturally, if they're not processed. Just by itself, salt is a pretty impressive rock. But Alexandra tells me that, like wine, each salt has its own terroir. Look at Murray River pink salt. It's what we call lake salt. So they've got a salty, briny artesian basin underneath the earth and it retains this beautiful pinkness from all the trace elements and minerals that are found naturally in those salt lake beds. And it's beautiful not only just to look at, but also that lovely mineraliness is great on meat like beef. And then we make a salt down in the Air Peninsula where the water comes from the Great Australian Bight. And that salt has this beautiful, clean, crisp flavour. So our salt off the east coast near Rockhampton in central Queensland is like the grey salt, the sel gris out of France, like the Celtic salts, and that tastes like the ocean. 
Okay, so we know how to use salt and where it comes from. But what I really want to know is whether there's such a thing as correct or perfect seasoning. To find out, I went to someone who teaches the pros, Tom Milligan. He's the culinary arts technical director at Le Cordon Bleu, a network of hospitality and culinary schools spread around the world. And he spent a lot of time working out how to salt food. Well, like I say, in cooking, we're always looking for that perfect taste, that perfect dish. How I see it is we're always looking for that bliss point, that perfect mouthfeel, the sweet spot, if you like. And that's where the salt helps us, you know. I think the key for a successful dish for a chef is having it seasoned properly so that no one needs to add salt or seasoning at the table, making sure that you've got that uh, balance of uh, sweet, salty, bitter, umami flavour, you know, which everyone is searching for now. Some people might instinctively know what that perfect balance feels like, but I'm still left wondering, if we all taste food differently, won't our bliss points all be different too? And what does this mean for chefs and food critics who have built careers on seasoning and the diners who still sometimes find restaurant food sickly salty? It's time to bring in the academics. My name is Russell Keast. I'm a professor of sensory and food science. I head up the Cass Food Research Centre at Deakin University in Melbourne. My area of research expertise is really around the sense of taste, why we eat what we eat and potentially, you know, what what drives overconsumption leading to obesity. So, Russell, can we actually say that something is perfectly seasoned? In terms of sensing salt and what we experience from salt, it does vary between people quite considerably. So one person may be saying, I think it's over-salted. I'm just getting too much saltiness out of the food. Another person is saying, well, pass me the salt shade because I need to add a little bit more to it because it's not salty enough. So that's the type of variation that occurs throughout the population. And the majority of people, you know, around about average in terms of, you know, if you're seasoning well, you're going to strike most people. But there are extremities where some people would find perfectly seasoned food to be way too salty, others who find that perfectly seasoned food to be uh, not salty enough. Okay, so if a food critic thinks the dish is perfectly salted, are they basically just saying it's perfect for them? Do they taste things more accurately than the rest of us? You would imagine that if you're a food critic, you are probably going to be relatively normal in terms of your sensory system, meaning that you match 60 or 70 percent of the population. And and just because if you went there, you know, and you were highly sensitive to sodium and you go into a restaurant, you're writing, this is way too salty, this is way too, you know, you, you would be just in terms of natural selection, you would be weeded out because you wouldn't be a good restaurant critic because most people would go there and go, you know, this is perfectly seasoned for me. Why is it that we taste salt differently? So our tongue is the primary tool for tasting food. And on the tongue, everybody has different numbers of taste buds. Those taste buds are responsible for detecting chemicals in foods. So if you've got a lot of taste buds, you're going to be getting strong signals to the brain regarding the chemicals in that food. If you've got very few taste buds, those signals aren't going to be as strong and therefore the flavour you're experiencing when you taste foods differs between individuals. So when I eat a food, I experience um, the flavour of that food in a unique way. When you taste food, you will also experience it in a unique way. It turns out perfect seasoning is a myth, though there is a general standard that most of the population, as Professor Keast said, would generally agree is just about right. That means that critics and chefs, while they might know more about food than the regular Joe, have palates that are likely very similar to the majority of the population's, any better or sharper. The outliers, the super tasters, and people simply born to crave the taste of salt a little more or less than others. I'm not opposed to having a little pot of salt on the table. I think people have different palates. I'd rather season something close to the edge, but slightly under so that people that have really salty palates can add a little bit of salt to something to lift that flavor to their liking. 
So I think it's kind of nice when you go to a restaurant and they have that there. I mean, of course, we'd all love to say that we're so confident in our seasoning that we don't need to offer that. But I think there's so many variables involved that just a little bit of salt extra on a table can just make all the difference. This episode of FYI was written and reported by Shay Marie Trigg. The show is produced by Carla Arnold, executive produced by Ellen Fraser, and hosted by me, Katja Vuchtel. Martin Peralta mixed the episode and, along with Alexander Gao, composed our theme music. Additional engineering by Derek Myers at Castaway Studios. Design by the company you keep. Editorial direction by Ellen Fraser and Katja Vuchtel. Special thanks to Peter Trigg, Ellen and Cheryl Fraser, Daniela Frangos, Thomas Telegrammer, Emma Joyce, Sarah Norris, Ravina Kant, Lucy Matthews, Claire Booth and Byron Jay. Also thanks to everyone at Broadsheet who helped make the show happen. To hear more FYI, subscribe in your favourite podcast player. You'll find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and where all good podcasts are found. If you like the show, leave us a rating. If you want to get in touch, you can reach us at podcast at broadsheet.com.au. FYI is by Broadsheet, Australia's go-to culture guide. For more fascinating slices of culture in your city, head to broadsheet.com.au.